Are you a fan of classic prop liners or larger GA piston aircraft? The Oli XM Lockheed Lodestar might just be for you. Today on Flight Brothers FT, we will explore this aircraft's features while operating a short scenic flight from Wellington to Christchurch, New Zealand. Welcome to Flight Brothers FT, produced by Tim and Lee. Plan the flight and fly the plan. All charts courtesy of Navigraph Charts, not to be used for real-world navigation. Be sure to subscribe and explore the rest of the channel for high-quality aviation content and entertainment. Welcome to Wellington, New Zealand. Today we are exploring the Oli XM Lockheed Lodestar while operating a flight down to Christchurch today. The exterior model of this Lodestar is accurate and quite appealing. Incorporating PBR textures, which make for very nice reflections, especially on deliveries with metallic finishes. Today we are operating as Trans Australia Airlines, which is one of the 10 included liveries with this aircraft. A paint kit is also available online, but as of this recording, only one other user-created livery has been available. Moving inside, we see a complete passenger cabin. It has a mild level of details, but accurate modeling. Its main drawback is uh, somewhat simplistic textures overlaying that modeling, but it does seem to give an accurate representation of this cabin and what it might be like to be inside. The interior can be swapped for a military interior with bare walls and bench style seating by loading the included C60 military variant. However, up front here in the cockpit, there won't be any difference on that variant. While up here in the cockpit, we can see a little more attention has been paid to the small details, which is really what you want because this is where you will spend your time. The Lodestar is a peer to the Douglas DC-3 Dakota entering service only four years later than the Douglas model in 1940. Our Lodestar has slightly less total passenger capacity, but is 15 feet shorter than the DC-3. The flat sides of the Lodestar make for a far more dated appearance both inside and out than the DC-3 has. The DC-3's interior is closer to the tubular cabins of modern airliners. Having flown the AeroWorks DC-3 extensively, I can't help but make some comparisons when flying this aircraft. If you have flown the AeroWorks or perhaps the V-Sky Lab C-47 or DC-3, please let us know in the comments what you think of this aircraft, what are your uh, impressions, and if you've flown them both, certainly how you think they compare. The Oleax Sim Lodestar provides you with three panel options depending on your navigational preferences. The classic panel provides only slant alpha capabilities for radio navigation, which is appropriate for the era of this aircraft. Option two is a Garmin 430, which is mounted rather unobtrusively at the first officer's panel. This is the variant we will use for today's flight, although I will not be navigating by the Garmin, but it is on board. Option three is a modernized panel upgrade, which includes modern radios on the overhead, a center-mounted large G430 with integrated autopilot. Please note, this is the only model, the fully modernized panel, that will include a nav function on its integrated autopilot. With the traditional or the Garmin 430 only panels, it's going to rely on you using heading mode and the navigational instruments to set your course correctly. So choose wisely the level of uh, instrumentation you are up for piloting. I feel the features of the Lodestar are best demonstrated through use. Uh, so I, I rolled around with, should this be a first look or some sort of tutorial? And I think just basically this is gonna be an overview while in flight. So for our demonstration flight today, we will be flying from Wellington, New Zealand, over the water and down the coast to Christchurch, New Zealand. Flight planning is very critical in this particular class of aircraft as we are going to be limited by our unpressurized cabin to lower altitudes and therefore we are way more impacted by potential weather and terrain. Simbrief does not have a profile at the moment for the Lodestar, but since it is in many ways rather comparable to the DC-3, you can do your planning with the DC-3 profile and then make any modifications. At this point, I have not done that, so I don't have any specific tips for you know, correcting the fuel or other load-specific things. But basically, fuel burn 
and uh, load capacity would be the two main things you would really need to tweak. Since our route today is pretty simple, I am planning this myself. Uh, we have selected three ground nav aids as our waypoint with Whiskey November VOR right here at the departure airport, the Kilo India NDB en route, and the Charlie Hotel VOR at the destination airport. This is going to let us play with the radio nav and the instrumentation on our Lodestar. The Oli XM Lodestar uses the default weight and fuel menu, which is really not a big deal to me, but I know some people really want to have a custom when they buy uh, payware aircraft. Unfortunately, uh, the one thing that does bug me is the documentation really lacks specific performance charts for us to calculate fuel burn at altitude and whatnot. So we're going to have to go a little bit basic for the planning. So if we look at the chart, uh, we can get a rough estimate off of sky vector as to the amount of time our aircraft will be airborne. And from there, we can use X-Plane's load menu for its generic fuel estimate. If you really want to get into it, uh, other flight bro Lee really does. You can record the fuel, start calculating the fuel burn yourself, and then bam, you won't need the documentation. But uh, I would have appreciated if that even some basic uh, burns might have been included for us. All right, so seeing only a little over an hour of estimated flight time and not much in the way of diversion fields on the way down the coast here, I'm gonna load up enough fuel for us to get there and back plus another 30 minutes of flying time as calculated by the X-Plane load menu. For our weather fans, it does appear that the Librain or Librain or however you wanna say it, <laughs> um, effect is working here as we have some drizzle coming in this morning during our pre-flight. Speaking of which, now is a really good time for us to check the weather for today's flight. I'm going to use another free online resource, windy.com. When you enter the airport code in the search bar, you'll see Windy can provide you with tabs for a lot of information, including the METAR and the TAF. Uh, the METAR is going to be your current weather and some previous weather reports, and the TAF is your terminal area forecast, which shows you what's anticipated to be. The slider at the top for raw mode allows you to see it in the traditional coded aviation format or to convert it just to plain English if you need some help or just don't feel like working that hard. Currently we are seeing winds at 19 knots, which is pretty extreme for an aircraft of this size. Um, uh, even for a larger aircraft we might be approaching some, uh, some, some limitations on takeoff with that much wind. Christchurch, our destination, is reporting milder winds, so that's going to help us out here for landing. And we'll also show you the plain English version, sliding that raw to converted slider. Continuing with our pre-flight, let's check the plate for Wellington. Uh, thank you again to Navigraph Charts for allowing us to display their subscription content in our videos. We do pay for our subscriptions, but we have asked their permission because this is their copyrighted proprietary things, and uh, we gladly recommend them to you. Navigraph Charts is fantastic. You're going to notice here on the chart for our uh, departure a ton of advisories. Uh, this is quite a lot for any one airport. We have shipping. We have terrain, we have wind shears, taxiway restrictions, birds, and helicopters just to top it all off. This little airport is definitely offering some challenges. Uh, I really recommend if you've never simmed it that you uh, give it a try. I happen to have a brother who lives in the area of Wellington and uh, it's uh, every bit as epic in real life as you're going to find it to be in the sim uh, and more so. So, while there are GPS departures charted here, I want to do radio nav today. Again, it's more era appropriate for the Lodestar. The departure plate can give us some guidance. So, if we look at using the Whiskey November VOR for our departure, we can start to see what our routes outbound might be. I do not have any live traffic or anything turned on, so the, the necessity to fly an RNAV departure that anyone else needs to coordinate with uh, does not exist for me right now. Now you may have noticed some ground equipment around our aircraft like wheel chocks. 
To install or remove these items, you're going to click the warning plate label labeled Remove All Control Locks Before Takeoff. This is a hidden toggle button for the ground equipment, so you just tap that. If you go to an external view, you'll see it's gone. Oh, oh and I also forgot to mention, I don't remember if it goes to the ground equipment or with the door, but there is also a uh, step set of steps at the rear entry door. Speaking of the door, to close it, you've been given a switch on the captain's radio panel. It's not hidden, it is labeled door. Another nice little cockpit feature we have up here is movable windows for both the captain and first officer. Opening them definitely affects the sound environment and I like to open them so I can hear the engine start in all of its glory. The V-Speed placard right here on the captain's panel also includes some hidden menus. At the top side of it, a click will open a camera menu giving you various preset views. And the bottom of the V-Speed placard opens up the aircraft's checklist. This is an interactive checklist, so the items here that are not complete will be shown in red text, which you can see if I play with the fuses. And I have to admit, I don't have many aircraft that have animated fuses uh, included. Um, I have not really gone to see if the fuses work, like for example, if we find the fuse for uh, avionics or radios, will it deactivate it? But uh, it's a neat feature. Now, one thing I have noticed, I, I've not had any luck with ATIS working in here. Um, I'm not sure if that's something with my settings. I have a variety of aircraft where uh, the ATIS is coming in fine and a few where it's not. So I'm not going to hands down say this is something wrong with the Oli XM. It could just be mine. But uh, I'm just going to note I, I've had issues getting the radio to come in on ATIS. Uh, interestingly enough, the radio, uh, the audio for the nav radios is coming in. So those uh, Morse codes, uh, those are receiving. All right, so next up, engine start. It's fairly simple. If you've flown uh, any of the DC-3s or you're familiar with piston engine starts, not a very complicated procedure. Before we start moving the aircraft, uh, let's see a few more features now that we're powered up here. We have a transponder that's been included and styled as an area rate uh, era, sorry, not area, a radio dial from the era of the radios on board. I appreciate that we've got the transponder and I appreciate that it's been integrated in such a way as it doesn't make some weird anachronism like, oh look, a modern transponder. So if you want to go fly some good old World War II routes and whatnot, use that basic cockpit and it won't be uh, obtrusively annoying you with a modern look there. It's nicely blended. We also have wipers that work on board. And since the rain is working, we can wipe that away. Our cabin chimes for seatbelt and no smoking also light up in the cabin and make the appropriate chime sounds. As noted before, when you close the windows, it does change the soundscape up here. So that's uh, appreciated for accuracy's sake. One thing to note, the compass card needs to be resynced through this button over here. And somewhat frequently, as it were, uh, again, if you're used to flying that DC-3, you might be used to the um, needing to recalibrate to the compass. Here, you don't need to go and actually check the compass and do it. You're just going to click sync. And you, you can see the deviation is actually listed there, so you'll actually know it's off just by looking at that indicator. All right, as we get rolling here, I have a few taxi tips for you if you're not used to tail draggers. Uh, and this really is gonna depend a lot on whether or not you have foot pedals so you can get uh, differentiated braking, or if you're using just the rudder. So one of the main features of a tail dragger is the um, castering tail wheel. It can be locked and should be locked for takeoff but you actually might find it a lot more controllable but less maneuverable if you lock the wheel. So if you unlock the wheel, you're gonna be able to perform some very sharp turns, which makes it easy. You can spin on a dime, basically, by giving it a little bit of throttle and engaging either the left or the right brake. 
but this can also lead to a lot of oversteer while you're trying to taxi out, as well as ground loops if you let the tail wheel move beyond the track of your main gear. Uh, if you've never done a ground loop, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. You'll be helpless for a moment while it basically spins out at you. So my normal trick is I unlock the tail wheel to do a maneuver, for example, to turn to get out of my parking space or to turn onto a taxiway or onto the runway. But then once I'm lined up on the runway, I relock the tail wheel to make it easier to stay in a straight line. Again, make sure you lock the wheel for takeoff and landing. Taxi visibility is quite realistically awful. Uh, since we are a tail dragger, our nose is pointed up and it's very difficult to get a good view. One of our preset viewpoints is kind of like leaning your head over against the window. And uh, I actually appreciate the accuracy of that, although you can tweak the viewpoints, but uh, the, the nose is so high up, you're never really gonna get up high enough to make it uh, easy per se. The typical procedure for a tail dragger, because of this awful visibility, is to do kind of small S turns. So, you know, turn the nose to the right so you can see, adjust back to straight, turn, turn left, uh, and then your co-pilot can see that's uh, doing what you gotta do to maintain some visibility. As we're taxiing, I've got on the taxi light. You'll notice our taxi light, just like its uh, compadre, the DC-3, is housed in the nose cone, which is kind of a neat looking feature there. It's uh, unique by today's standards. As we're taxiing out, we can tune up that VOR for our departure. If we check our taxi takeoff list, we have some performance guidance. Now this might be unusual to you if you're used to only flying modern jetliners or only the most uh, basic of GA, like uh, the 172. But if you spend any time messing around with your uh, variable pitch prop liners, even the smaller ones, or uh, something like a Beechcraft Baron, then you're probably kind of used to looking at manifold pressures and RPMs. So basically these are going to be the power settings that we handle. We're not looking at N1s and exhaust gas or any of those sorts of things. So basically we're going to do all of our settings on a certain amount of manifold pressure and a certain RPM. So you can see here our recommended takeoff setting is 45.5 inches manifold pressure and 2500 RPM. To quickly recall these, because that's a lot of numbers, I think of it as 4525. So 45 inches on the manifold, approximately, and 2,500 RPM, 45.25. You can see in our climb phase listed in step five, we're gonna reduce that to 30.22, or 30 inches manifold pressure, and 2,200 RPM. And we are gonna trim the aircraft down for an airspeed of 120 knots. If you're not familiar with tail draggers, you have an additional step uh, in the takeoff roll of the tail rising. Our Lodestar's tail came up at about 60 knots for me on this takeoff. That might vary a little bit with weight and balance depending on how heavy you are going out and where your CG point is. And we're lifting off at about 100 knots without really needing any back pressure, which is floating off the runway. This is a very noticeable difference for those of you used to uh, modern jetliners that we don't really have the need to give an extreme rotation and pull ourselves up to 10 or 15 degrees. The straight wing prop liners have uh, a lot of lift and a much flatter pitch on climb out. Uh, for, honestly, if you drag the nose up to 15 degrees, you're going to have airspeed problems here. Now I didn't neglect my landing light before takeoff, so let's put that on now just to give us uh, added visibility for all that live traffic that I don't have anyway. I've included a little bit of external takeoff footage here. If you notice the weather's different, I recaptured that from replayed mode after landing and the weather had changed substantially on route. So it is what it is, but it'll give you some ideas of uh, the different angles there. But the weather on the actual departure for me was the kind of garbage overcast weather with the spitting rain that you're seeing. You might notice we have some very realistic icing conditions, and if I don't have the window ice on, we'll get the windows icing up. 
Since icing is a consideration, we can turn on some of our anti-ice features, but just something to be aware of, we are not going to be able to climb over it in this unpressurized aircraft. Our pop-up checklist has some cruise performance settings. So while we didn't really get the performance charts and the fuel burn type charts that I wanted for calculating, you know, best range, etc., we do have guidance here in the checklist. So they haven't left you completely without guidance. It's just not everything I, I might have expected. And it's possible that uh, perhaps those resources just don't exist. A lot of times with these classic aircraft, they will attempt to find original manuals and uh, pass on original charts to you. If we check our pop-up X-plane map, you can kind of see we've been wandering around our course. Uh, that's kind of to be expected with hand flying during radio nav. And it's one of the reasons uh, separation rules used to be so much more generous than they are now today because the RNAV is so much more accurate and you should not have this wandering about the course on a modern GPS navigated aircraft. Since our nav displays are directional indicators only, we're going to need to do a little bit more work than you might even be used to doing slant alpha with the typical CDI integrated into a compass card that you get on most of our X-Plane uh, piston and GA aircraft. The CDI is that course deviation indicator. It's that little line that floats to the left and right on the compass card. And the, the main thing we're gonna do to find our course now is we need to look at the direction indicator and find out what radial, by looking at the charts, we desire to be on. Then we're gonna fly our aircraft basically to that radial to make the needle match whatever our calculated indication would be. So you don't really have to have the CDI, it just would have made our life easier, but that's part of the joy of flying these classic aircraft is you get to do a little bit more work. You're not the uh, child of the magenta line who's just gonna punch in some FMC, launch the aircraft, and then spend the rest of the trip watching Netflix in another window. You actually get to fly the plane, which uh, that's what I like. Looking around from the cabin, you can see we've got some, I don't know if this is supposed to be condensation or an icing effect. Uh, I, I've noticed it in different weather conditions back here on the passenger windows. Looking closely at our panel, we've got our nav functions, our distance measuring equipment, the DME, as well as our ADF receiver, which has its own needle indicator pointing to the ground station. And again, it doesn't hurt to check our pop-up map just to make sure we are where we think we are. Now as the weather starts to clear, we get some beautiful views of the coastline of New Zealand and the mountains. You can uh, very easily see why Lord of the Rings was filmed here. I'll have to admit, as soon as I looked out the window and saw that, I thought, I need to do this trip over again in uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator now that the new 2020 version has such fantastic functionally ortho scenery for the whole planet. I'm kind of curious to see how it looks. I'm still a huge fan of X-Plane's fantastic uh, simulation accuracy, but from a scenery standpoint, Microsoft's doing a great job. However, X-Plane's still looking great here, and I'm really enjoying the trip. This is actually my first flight in New Zealand at all, but I can tell right now this is not going to be my last flight over here. So again, this was a rather short flight, so as we are approaching our destination, it's time to kind of brief our arrival. We can use the pop-up for weather since I'm having trouble receiving ATIS. And we can see the winds are indicating that runway 29 is going to be the most into the wind available. Taking a peek over at Sky Vector, we can look at the arrival, and it looks like we're going to annoy the residents of Christchurch by flying directly over their heads to get to runway 29. Looking at our descent checklist, they're telling us we should be checking the carb, heat, temperature, the oil, and cylinder head temperatures. And we have a descent profile for manifold pressure. It's saying the manifold pressure should increase one inch per 4,000 feet as the air density is increasing for constant power. I don't know how much I'm gonna try and actually hold to that. It's just an interesting reference that it's here. Perhaps if you fly this aircraft a lot, you'll be able to uh, see if, if that's exactly how it 
pans out. And we have our approach checklist for landing. Let's get another position check using our pop-up map to make sure we're where we think we should be. It's basically a visual approach today as the weather has cleared up quite nicely. As we're on final and we start extending flaps, you'll notice the pitch tendency on this aircraft is for the nose to come up for each notch of flaps. So you'll want to be prepared to trim that out and to compensate with yoke in the meantime. The Lodestar handles quite nicely on landing, which honestly most of these old prop liners do. They're low, they're slow, the wings provide a lot of lift even at these slower speeds. But there's one thing some captains need to be aware of if you're used to modern tricycle gear and you're going to be landing a tail dragger. Uh, if you want a more detailed explanation of, of technique or if you just want to hear me being really, really frustrated, go check out uh, my review of the freeware Supermarine Spitfire. I had a real terrible time figuring out how to land that correctly. It was nowhere near as gracious as the Lodestar or the DC-3R. So uh, here's just the quick tips. Do not come in fast. And when you start to flare for the runway, uh, the way I've heard it described is don't give back any yoke. So as you start to flare and bleed off airspeed and are coming down to the runway, obviously you don't want to be too high. We don't want to fall like a stone. But don't correct by letting uh, the, the flight stick or your yoke come back forwards. As you pull back, maintain that amount of pressure. Pull back more as you need to, kind of keep it level. But you're just going to keep pulling back as it loses airspeed. The aircraft should slow and naturally settle down to the runway where you're going to go for perhaps a three-point landing coming down on all three gear at the same time or on the mains and then letting the tail settle things to be cautious of with the mains. If you come in too fast or at uh, too high of a descent rate onto the mains, you can definitely expect a bounce and not just one bounce, but probably numerous bounces. Controlling the aircraft during the bounce is going to become very difficult as you will not have enough airspeed left to really maintain control authority. And so you're gonna have this very poorly controlled hopping aircraft down the runway and not very safe and uh, not going to make for a good landing video to share on the YouTube. So again, uh, just work on your landing technique and, it, and it's really quite nice to land. Be prepared to lose visibility as that tail settles and again the nose comes up. One last thing, it might be obvious to you with the main gear being where it is, well, balance is a huge consideration. If you come in hard and fast, if you try and get on those brakes, you're obviously going to put a lot of inertia forwards and you do risk toppling the aircraft onto its nose, damaging the props and causing all sorts of damage. So uh, again, don't come in too fast, work on that landing technique and you're gonna have a very nice experience. We hope you've enjoyed this short trip through New Zealand in the Oli XM Lockheed Lodestar. This aircraft is fairly recently released, only in the last couple of months, and is available on the xplane.org store for $24.95. There's at least one other classic airliner by Oli XM, uh, so if you enjoy this one, you might want to check that out. I have not checked it out myself. It's uh, a German Junkers. Uh, I'm not saying it's a piece of junk, that's the aircraft manufacturer, obviously. So be sure to hit like and subscribe here for Flight Brothers FT to see more of our videos and podcast content. You can also find more of both Lee and I over at fselite.net where we are video contributors. So until next time, Sim Captains, remember, plan the flight and fly the plan. If you enjoy this content, consider buying us a coffee to show your support. Visit us at buymeacoffee.com slash flightbrosft or search for us from the menu if you'd like to contribute. A link will be provided in the video description below.